They used to be called heavenly bodies. Our local star, prime mover of the earthly environment, father of all life. Our almost twin satellite, phasing predictably through the night. Small wonder both were regarded as gods by the ancients. Today we know the moon as a place. Now picture, if you will, a fantastic world where not one, but 12 moons crisscross the sky, four of them moving backwards, four others the size of small planets. This is Jupiter, largest member by far of the Sun's family, monarch of the outer planets, a thousand times the size of Earth. In fact, twice as large as all the other planets combined. It is nearly a small star, a second sun, Jupiter, named for the Roman god of gods. To our eyes, it reveals only its dazzling cloud tops, rivers of wild color, and its trademark, the great red spot, a perpetual storm of unknown origin. On Jupiter, day and night are each less than five Earth hours long, and a man would weigh 500 pounds. In early 1972, mankind launched Pioneer 10, the first mission to the outer planets, the first to venture out beyond the orbit of Mars, out through the Jupiter system, and eventually, out of our solar system completely. Share now, the odyssey of the Jupiter pioneers. The planets of our solar system come in two varieties. The inner four, including Earth, are heavy, rocky cinders. Where the fifth should be, there's only a band of debris, the asteroid belt. Beyond ride the enormous outer four, the mysterious gas giants. Astronomers have studied them since the time of Galileo. It was he who discovered Jupiter's four large moons with his newly perfected telescope. Beautiful ring Saturn. In 1979, Pioneer 11 will make mankind's first visit to Saturn. If it survives the rigorous journey of six years in time, nearly two billion miles in distance. Third of the gas giants, Uranus. Rotating on its side, it circles the sun like a fallen gyroscope. And finally, Neptune. One of Neptune's moons, and one moon belonging to Uranus, were discovered by this modern Galileo, the late Dr. Gerard Kuiper of the University of Arizona. His backyard in Tucson has flowers, a swimming pool, and a private observatory. Here at Catalina Peak, his studies have produced some of the most outstanding color photographs ever made of Jupiter from the Earth's surface. This is sort of a typical uh, photograph which uh, shows the red spot of the planet, which is the most prominent feature. This black uh, spot here is the satellite shadow, is the satellite EO, which is the nearest of the four large satellites of the planet. The uh, uh, satellite itself is here and doesn't show very well contrasted to the uh, planet itself. Now the first thing you see is first of course that the disk of the planet is elliptical. That is because of its rapid rotation, which is roughly 10 hours. The period is roughly 10 hours. The diameter of this planet is about 10 times the diameter of the Earth. So it is a gigantic planet. The total mass is not, however, a thousand times. The volume is a thousand times, but the mass is only about 300 times that of the Earth. So the mean density of this planet is somewhat like the sun. And that is because it is largely composed of hydrogen. 
So the composition of this planet is very, very different from the Earth and very similar, in fact, to the Sun, except the temperature, of course, is much lower than the Sun. And because the temperature is low, you get a chemistry here, which is totally different from the Sun. So you have all these interesting colors here, and what we have been doing in recent years is to try to understand both the motions of all these clouds and their composition. Our odyssey to the outer planets begins here at Cape Kennedy. A good omen under a mock Jupiter sunrise, the ungainly pregnant guppy delivers a special cargo. The Jupiter Pioneers were built by TRW Systems of Redondo Beach, California, under contract to NASA's Ames Research Center. The project involved some 25 million man-hours of meticulous work by the government, industry, university, pioneer team. Each marvelously compact and reliable spacecraft weighs less than 600 pounds, including some 65 pounds of scientific instruments. The 11 onboard sensors include five radiation and charged particle detectors, one magnetometer, and three light measuring devices, one for the visible spectrum and one for either end of the visible range, the infrared and the ultraviolet. There's also an experiment to look for asteroids and one to measure the number of times Pioneer is struck by space dust. All of these devices together use less electricity than one 25-watt bulb. That's energy conservation. Two other investigations dig out new information about the Jupiter system from ground tracking data. The question arises, what can 65 pounds of space-borne instruments tell us that Earth's finest facilities can't? For example, the famous Mount Palomar telescope with its 17-foot diameter glass eye. A scientist who uses both Pioneer and Palomar is Dr. Guido Munch of Caltech. We have used the 200-inch telescope extensively for planetary observations. This is the largest operating telescope that has ever been Built. With this telescope, the planet Jupiter appears of the size of a 50 cent piece. The Pioneer infrared experiment will provide a map of the heat emitted by the planet with a three inch telescope. But at the distance of closest approach, the planet will cover one fifth of the sky. And this is the advantage that we get from the three-inch telescope to the ground base with the large telescope here. The need to measure the quantity of heat accurately is that all the meteorology, all the motion of the clouds that we see in Jupiter is governed by the amount of heat coming from the inside. And we hope that a real understanding of the meteorology of Jupiter will in fact provide us with a better way to handle our weather problems. The second day of March, 1972, Pioneer 10 waits for launch atop a new three-stage version of the Atlas Centaur rocket. later, a sister spacecraft, Pioneer 11, left the pad on its long and chancy voyage to Jupiter and Saturn. It's not easy to break out of the solar system. It requires enough speed to defeat the sun's gravity as well as Earth's gravity. Pioneer streaks away faster than any previous spacecraft, gulping distance at a million miles a day passing the moon in just 11 hours.
still, Jupiter is nearly two years away. On the way out past Mars, the experiments are tested and calibrated. Their data add to mankind's understanding of the interplanetary climate of space. The asteroid belt, as some had imagined it. Before Pioneer 10, it was pictured as a region where great boulders grind together, creating a 40,000 mile per hour sandstorm. If so, it might have represented a perpetual barrier to outer planet flights. In fact, the pioneers found very little space dust in the asteroid belt. True, there are several thousand asteroids, some as big as Texas, but they should offer no menace to navigation. Pioneer gets its electricity from small onboard atomic heat sources. At a half billion miles, the sun is too weak to power solar cells. The spacecraft spins five times a minute for stabilization. On ground command, small thrusters fire to maintain the spin rate and to keep the large dish antenna precisely pointed at the receding Earth. This radio link is a two-way street. A constant stream of information flows back about the health of the Pioneer and its scientific observations. NASA's Deep Space Network tracks the mission. So sensitive are these ears that they will hear Pioneer out to nearly two billion miles and lose contact late in 1979. Pioneer is managed and controlled from Ames Research Center located at Mountain View, California near San Francisco. The nerve center is in this building. Pioneer project manager, Charles F. Hall. So we're in the mission control area for Pioneer 10, and behind us is the mission control room. Now right now they're preparing to send uh, quite a few commands up to the spacecraft merely to uh, change the attitude of the, one of the instruments, the operating mode, so that we can uh, look on Jupiter. The interesting feature here is that the uh, round trip light time, the time to get a message from here up to the spacecraft and then to get a return answer is an hour and a half. So our people in there have to be used to this uh, uh, hour and a half delay when they start planning the mission. Commander R-10. R-10. Uh, we just received the stack clear message. Roger. R-10 command, I'll verify command stack loaded. Block message number nine, first command, IP whiskey two, time one four one zero three two decimal eight. Roger, copy, we're enabling message stand at this time. The pioneers are run by men who send commands from Earth, not by automatic systems on board. This cuts complexity and costs. During encounter, it's busy here. For example, to command just the electronic camera that makes pictures of Jupiter, Pioneer Control transmits some 15,000 commands in just two months. In response to these commands, the camera scans Jupiter's turbulent cloud tops as Pioneer spins toward encounter. Because the spacecraft is moving at up to 80,000 miles per hour, and because Jupiter is rotating at 22,000 miles per hour, the scans do not immediately form a pretty picture. They must be decoded and corrected for distortion. First, the scans are built up line by line on a television display. This gives a quick look at the operation of the system and a tantalizing hint of the spectacular pictures buried in the raw data. After the first stage of prettying up, Jupiter's first close-up portrait emerges. Late November, 1973, 20 months after launch, Pioneer 10 closes in on Jupiter. Each hour brings the planet 20,000 miles closer. What lies below those inscrutable cloud tops? Could there be life in this maelstrom where pressures may reach 200,000 times Earth?